It's always with great humility that I stand in front of you here. There's a lot of talent in this room. And on your shoulders, I've learned a lot. So this is the ninth High Performance Design Meets Boots on the Ground. It's a boots on the ground is really what's key here. It's one thing to come with a design and a concept, but the builders have to execute. So uh, I guess it was probably almost a year ago, Chris, two years ago, Christine and I saw this building. And uh, we saw this building. It's, it's exactly halfway between our office and our house. So I figure we drove by it like 100 times until we eventually just bought it. So uh, it's right here. And the really neat thing was that, I mean, we wanted, to, we wanted to create a rental property and we wanted to try passive house principles on it. And it was something we just had to do. So we didn't know if it really made sense economically, but we wanted to try it. And um, the idea was that I would build it, and we've done a couple of projects that way. And so, um, of course, we design it, and then we'd also manage it. So it's a full design, build, develop kind of model. So the, nice, the thing we liked about this was that you've got Dundas here, you've got Lansdowne right there, but what we really liked was that you actually had these two party walls, and that gave us a lot of, uh, a lot of help. Like right away, we're like, wow, there's just a lot less exterior wall on this. Um, and then it also it allowed us to create three different units. So we had two uh, one bedroom units that come in from the back, and that's from this laneway. So this is a great opportunity to come in from the back. And then we had a, a three bedroom unit up here that uh, my nephew would call an upside down house because you've got the kitchen living room up here. And it worked quite well. So, um, of course, the exciting thing was that because you have two neighbors, you really have a lot, very little exterior wall. And in fact, interesting, we, we modeled with uh, Renew Engineering what it would, well, I won't get into that. But it's, it's, so that's really the opportunity. We saw that we could probably reach passive house uh, principles with not crazy insulation values because the heat loss was so little. We had so little exterior wall. So my purpose here though, the, the, pro, the challenge was going to be the air barrier. So this like, I'm gonna talk about the air barrier. Getting an airtight, and of course, it's not, ironically, the airtight to the outside is not so much the hard thing. It's the airtight to next door, which we learned later. So, uh, I like to think of this as a system and a process rather than a thing. So I'm looking at it in several ways. The new roof, and my feeling when we're doing this is, we got this. This is, this is going to be great. Right? So we had a bit of an addition at the back, and the detail that we thought, I probably thought most about was the nice clean detail that happens at the top of the new roof. So A, no neighbors here, exterior wall, clean new framing. So the idea was we'd have a low level air barrier on, on the sheathing and it would come in right underneath the roof, uh, the curb, and it would lap over the air barrier that we had on the wall. Like, you know, we're feeling great. We're, this is gonna be perfect. What problems can we have, right? So, and you know, even this was a bit of a challenge convincing uh, my carpenters to put a piece of blue skin down. The roofers didn't really know what we were talking about exactly, but but we did it by putting these little strips of blue skin and having these tie-ins. And, you know, and it worked very well. The, the, of course, there's only about eight feet of this wall condition. Like, really. Like, so we had about 16 other wall conditions. So the next one was the party wall condition. So existing wall, and of course, as Greg and Shervin would tell you, this masonry wall is, is, not, is basically a sponge. I mean, it's, it's the most, one of the most porous materials that we get because even the bricks are porous and, and then even you got this nice little chimney right up the middle. So this is really a problem. So well, we knew that the solution was we we're going to have some kind of roll-on air barrier and then we we're going to tie in to the low-level air barrier that's on the roof deck with some kind of clever little tape here and that's going to work out perfectly. <laughs> well, I probably spent like there was probably a 20 versions of that detail until we got to this job site and then it lasted about three minutes. Um, <laughs> my carpenter finally said, you know, what are we doing that for? I'm gonna wrap the, I'm gonna create a ledger 
run it along the party walls, I'm going to wrap it first while it's on the ground, and then you can tie into it. So perfect. And then it's nice, when you put the plywood on top, it just squeezes down into the blue skin. Perfect. Problem solved. We've got two details out of the way, and you know, maybe, maybe we've got you know, 5% of our conditions, but we're feeling good. <laughs> so uh, then we've got the front roof and the bay window. And, and this was where we were haunted by old framing. So the problem was that, if you remember, there was a bay window and a front roof and a gable. And we thought, well, the, the common idea, the, the good idea would be to just rip this off and rebuild it. Well, but then you've got to get a scaffolding out here, and that costs about $5,000, and then you've got to get all this work done in about you know, a month, because there's no way you're going to pay for the scaffolding for two months. And, and so we thought, well, you know what? This is actually pretty good. We could, we could fix this up. So we, we, stripped the, we stripped the roof. Oh, OK, well, here's the detail. So it didn't look that bad in the detail, but I would call this wishful thinking. But the idea was we'd, we'd sort of somehow sneak this air barrier up the inside wall. We'd frame in all the. The funny thing about these old buildings is they, they don't have hard edges. Like, things just dissolve at the sides. <laughs> like, you, don't, you just don't need anything here if you're building in the 1880s. There's just a two-foot hole, right? So, um, so of course you have to go around and fill all these joy spaces. So okay, we have a hard surface here. So that's working okay. Um, but the idea was then we'd, we'd just take this air barrier over this hard surface and tie it into the underside of, of the roof deck. And then to, for good measure, well, we were going to put this air barrier, roll, uh, we're just going to put an ice and water shield on the roof decking. Well, the roof decking was so rough, you can see this, it was so rough that we thought we'd be clever and we'd, we'd put another sheet of plywood. But then what do you do at the end condition? So we, we actually put the new sheet of ply and actually wrapped the air barrier underneath. But that didn't do anything. So and it probably caused even more problems. So then we basically just tried everything at this corner. So if this is, so everyone gets this, this is the front roof, this is the party wall. And this was just like the biggest air leaks that we've ever seen. So um, we tried every product. So here's our, here's our plywood. Here's some blue skin. Here's a roll-on um, blue skin air barrier type product, which didn't work very well when my carpenters put it on, because they put it on nicely with a paintbrush. The drywallers knew how to put it on, because they put it on with a trowel. They just slapped it on. So that worked, but then there was leakage around the plywood. So we had to like black death all that. Still leaking. Then the carpenters started to use the, uh, the gun foam in between every joint. Still leaking. Oh, by the way, they'd already rolled all this stuff up. So we basically tried everything. It slowed it down. It wasn't bad, but it was just a bad situation to begin with. So then we found that the only way to properly do this was in multiple layers. So we, we did a flash coat of foam to kind of stabilize the situation, and then we started air testing. And this is where Greg, I have to thank Greg and Shervin, they really helped a lot on this. Uh, Greg in the middle came about six times. And so we, we did a process that I think was very instructive. We, we air tested between every lift of foam. And my spray foamers just wanted to do a whole room at a time, just and we said during a flash coat on everything, and then we air test. And it was interesting how many air leakage leaks we got. So, and particularly around the old framing and the new framing. So then we started cutting framing out and finding weird leaks. And this was a real process, but we went through and you know, stopped that leakage. But eventually the thing got filled up with foam and it kind of worked, but it wasn't great. So the walls. So there, we tried everything so, because there's many ways to skin a cat and, and there wasn't one product. Um, we were going to stop air any way we could. Fortunately, there wasn't any one typical section of wall. So what we found though um, was that when we stripped the house that I was standing in here one day, quite dark, I could actually see tiny bits of light through the solid masonry wall. Like it's really like it's really not a solid thing. So we parged the whole thing. And that worked pretty well. We had about 80% we had about 80 of it done, maybe 75%. One of the greatest things we did was left the old parging and paint and just filled in those gaps. And this was the best air barrier in the, the whole place was the old, the old paint. 
Uh, we had weird situations, and this is where phasing became my big problem, that we, dis we removed things at the wrong time and made decisions in, a, you know, in, in the wrong order. So we removed a fireplace, and it was too late to get parging in, and our only choice was to do things like these flash coats. It was amazing how much air was going through the bricks, and like literally through the middle of a brick. We had these weird conditions where this is the dissolving neighboring building that's just not there. Um, even though we thought we had packed and filled all this eventually, this was one of the biggest air leaks we had, and, and it, was a, it was a chimney through the blue skin. So this was like three tubes of black death and staples and nails, and it's awful, but it was the only thing we could really do. And, you know, so um, windows and doors, we trusted you, and you let us down. This was... This worked pretty well. Uh, we, we blue skinned this. Uh, we, then we, we put our bucks around with drywall. We carefully spray foamed against that. No, you know, so this wasn't actually a problem. Um, what was frustrating was that even a fairly normal size four foot high window was starting to leak up there. And I think really the simply was because there was only one latch. So I, maybe this is an easy thing to fix. Maybe we should have demanded to have two latches. So uh, we're working, we work, started working with a company to figure out why their unit was leaking like there for a high performance window. Um, the sliding doors, they just leaked here and they just, there was nothing we could do to stop it from leaking there. So disappointing, but maybe in context, that's not such a big problem. Floor edges, this is where we really had problems. We had leaks in places that we didn't know existed. So this is one of those other details that we sweated a lot and we felt great about. Nice new joist in an old joist pocket. We put it in, we lined it with blue skin, we parged everything, we caulked it. It was fantastic. This worked perfectly. Too bad there wasn't that many of them. And then there's the other joist pockets that were really scary. So some places we had to leave the existing joist. And there's a little curb on the foundation because it went from eight to 12. Oh, and there's this wood sill in there. And then we had to sister up the joist Then the carpenter got a little too close to the end. So we couldn't get the air seal in there. And um, the phasing didn't work out, so we used, fortunately we had that blue skin uh, trowel on stuff so we could put into here in time. But then there's the fire stop. And the fire stops just inherently work contrary to anything you're trying to do with air barrier. So I don't know what the answer is there, but this, these little cracks, Greg will remember this, became these like air highways that took the air from anywhere in this room because the fire stop went around the entire perimeter of every suite. That was a perfect little access point, and then it would like, take it right to the very end condition. So we had to caulk all of those. So the worst problem we had on this project, and that's the great thing about this presentation, I realize it now, was you know, we're all, we all talk about joist ends, but we never talk about joist sides. And in these old houses, the, the funny, the, the, the joists on this section of the floor are very close to the side wall, but, but not not far enough away that you can do something, but not close enough that you can air seal. So uh, we had problems at every one of these situations. Um, in one case, this was probably one of the better situations. We had nothing better to do than to fill it full of home and like, you know, hope for the best. Uh, a lot of other cases, we tried to line it with blue skin behind um, air seal top and bottom. It just really wasn't working. And this was one of our worst ones in the front. The funny thing is the, there's like a tiny little gap behind this joist um, because it's sistered onto an existing joist which is holding the bay window. So the air is getting in behind there over the fire separation and going out sideways. And I think our worst air leakage was when that side joist terminates in the wall. So it got out through the joist cavity, the joist pocket, and then out. So. Um, I mean, the answer to this is simple, is just cut them out and have a ledger. P parge the wall and then have a ledger. But by the time we realized that was a problem, there's too much other stuff in the way that, to actually do anything about it. And then walls. This, you know, I've always liked spray foam under a slab because it's, it's done quickly and it's all solid. I don't really have so much a problem with that. It's, this is a flawed idea to begin with, and we do this in all of our renovations for some reason, but running the dimple board up the wall. So now, You've got like an air seal problem normally would be where the slab meets the wall. Well, now you've taken that problem and you've like distributed it across the whole wall. <laughs> you really, and, and so you, we never noticed this before in our normal projects because we weren't getting to these airtight levels. But once we got to the one air change, 
these things start to whistle loudly. It was a musical instrument. Every little nail hole we had to find, and this is not a great perfect layer to begin with, but we had to start doing stupid things like, where's the crack? Where's the hole? Where's the, you know, and this sort of worked, but then it just, it ended up finding one hole and it can then distribute it all around. So you've taken a small problem and, and spread it out so that you can't deal with it. So I think the solution is to get rid of this. And we didn't even need it because, ironically, I waterproofed on the outside anyways. <laughs> so testing and results. So again, big shout out to Greg and Shervin of the Blue Green Group. Uh, Greg, Shervin was there in the beginning and the end. Uh, he did the first blower door and he helped us uh, commission a problem that we had with our heat pumps. Greg was there right in the middle and we probably did about, uh, well, we did six different air tests. And it's only here that we started bringing the foam in, and, and then it was between layers of foam, and it really helped. So we got to 1.18, uh, and then we threw in the towel because we started chasing, we were literally chasing pinholes. Uh, so how did we do? So we're at 1.18 air changes, and we we're trying to get to 0.6. Uh, in the Phi world, I guess in the Fias world, we we're at 0 0.08 uh, for square feet of wall area and we should have been up 0.05. Equivalent leakage area, so 291 centimeters squared versus 100 centimeters squared. This is the one I was most interested in. Um, so I just did a little diagram. So this is, this is 291 centimeters squared, so it's 17 by 17, and that's where we want it to be. So, I don't know if that makes me feel better or worse. Uh, <laughs> like, like it's, you know, it's the difference. The difference is, is, was, I don't know, is that within grasp or not? It doesn't seem like a lot when you do it this way. It seemed like a lot. So, but it, that did bring me uh, clarity to do, doing that. Um, what I also thought was interesting is we had um, our mechanical and envelope engineers renew engineering. Stuart, uh, Stuart Fix and Vincent Sang did this. Vincent did this model for me. So he updated our original model from the 0.6 air changes per hour to 1.2. So our energy demand is up 14%. So, and you know, I learned something every day in this business. He explained to me why, he, I didn't understand why he did this chart, the demand I do now. So, and half of you, I'm sure you all know this, but Energy demand is, is how much energy we're using if it's 100% efficient. So imagine if we were using electric baseboards, which are 100% efficient, we would have used 14% more energy. Um, by the way, to be at Fias Plus, we had to be at 20, and we're at 26. So that's not great. Uh, we're way off in the cooling. Um, Interestingly, the cooling, the cooling uh, load reduced because of the air leakage, and I don't, still don't quite get that, but I think it's just air losses in summer are helping cool the building. So uh, I don't really worry too much about that. What I found interesting, though, was that this 14% increase was that extra air loss. Wasn't actually so bad at the end of the day because the heat pumps are what we're using to heat and cool the place, and they kind of swept in and saved the day. Because of this coefficient of uh, performance, there's three times, three times factor or something like that. So, um, and, the long, and the long and short of it is that it's costing us 29 bucks uh, at the end of the year. That's the difference. So, does that make me feel worse? I don't know. It, it makes I don't know. It makes me feel doesn't make me feel better because then I'm like, there's got to be more to it than this, and there is. But it definitely puts it into perspective more so that the heat pumps, they really help because you're using so little energy to begin with. Um, and then just to bring it down to, uh, we're, we're, off, we're giving this, these units as all inclusive, everything's electric, one meter for everybody, and in, the, uh, in March, we're spending 38 bucks per person because there's seven people. So to me, that's a very interesting metric. It's not a lot of power and it's all, this is all really possible because of, of the envelope. Um, what do we change? What do we do the next time? Uh, well, it's great because we're going to do it again. We, we bought this place a few months ago, and we're going to do EcoFlats 2. The first thing I need to do for my air barrier is to make a project schedule. 
and I actually never had a schedule when I was doing it, 1737. It went very quickly. We got the whole thing done in a year, but things didn't happen quite in the right order, and, and all of the problems I think I had could have been solved with proper sequencing and a little bit more time at the right time. So we need to understand when the air barrier is, not where it is, where it falls into this process. And in this next project, I'm really gonna have a drop deadline. This is when the air barrier is installed, and this is when everything else can proceed. So that reno will look a little bit differently than normal ones. Like windows will be in, walls will be parged, caulking um, and penetrations will all be in, but nothing else should be in that shell. No interior partitions, no fire separations. Uh, there'll be an air barrier on the, on the roof, however we do that, but nothing else. And that's gonna be hard to convince the trades to work in that order, but that's the way to do it. And then we've got this time to deal with stuff and, and access. So thank you very much. Thank you.